two, one. We are live now. Uh, good evening, everyone. Today we are going to be talking about MR imaging of rotator cuff. So in the first session, we looked at the normal anatomy. In the second session, we looked at uh, anterior instability, which is a very common indication for imaging. And then the third session, we looked at uh, second session, we looked at the posterior instability and other, uh, uh, I think, superior labral lesions, uh, biceps labral complex. So today we are going to look at rotator cuff. When we talk of rotator cuff, it's important that the MRI is done rightly. We need to use a surface coil, a dedicated shoulder coil is uh, needed. And the shoulder should be placed in neutral position, not in internal rotation. That is important. Also, what we do is when we look at the MR, we first obtain axial images, which go from above the AC joint to below the shoulder joint. And then on these images, we identify the supraspinatus tendon, which we can see here. So this is the supraspinatal muscle and this is the supraspinatus tendon. And that is along which your oblique and oblique coronal and oblique sagittal images need to be planned. If one cannot make out the supraspinatus muscle and tendon, like we can see here, we can use the glenohumeral joint line. So this is the glenohumeral joint line. And you can plan the coronal images perpendicular to it. Sagittal images can be planned parallel to the glenohumeral joint line. This is important because if you obtain straight coronal without this angulation, it becomes very difficult to make out the anatomy and pathologies. So a quick recap through the anatomy. So this here is the acromioclavicular joint. As we go inferiorly, we can see the supraspinatus muscle. This is the supraspinatus muscle. And this here, this wide insertion is the supraspinatus tendon insertion. Anterior deltoid and the posterior deltoid. This here is the long head of biceps tendon arising from the superior supraglenar tubercle and going anteriorly. And this here is the infraspinatus insertion. This is still the supraspinatus muscle belly. This is the infraspinatal muscle insertion onto the greater tuberosity. Further down, you can see the infraspinatus muscle belly. And this is the infraspinatus tendon with its insertion onto the greater tuberosity. Now we start seeing the superior most fibers of the subscapularis. And this is the subscapularis muscle. You can see the subscapularis tendon and its insertion onto the lesser tuberosity. In the bicipital groove, here is the longer of biceps tendon. This is subscapularis muscle belly, subscapularis tendon, teres minor, and the teres minor tendon insertion. Deltoid. And we should also remember to look at the pectoralis major and minor in all cases. If we look at coronal images, we are coming from posterior to anterior. This is the teres minor muscle belly. This is infraspinatus, and you can see the infraspinatus tendon inserting onto the greater tuberosity. As we come more anteriorly, you can start seeing the supraspinatus muscle belly and the supraspinatus tendon. This is the supraspinatus footprint, while this is the critical zone. So all tendons normally look dark on all the sequences. This is because the collagen fibers are so tightly packed that there's no place for the hydrogen protons, the water molecules to move around. So it does not give any signal. As we come further anterior, we can now see the supraspinatus muscle, the supraspinatus tendon. And this here is still the infraspinatus muscle, supraspinatus muscle, supraspinatus tendon. And this is where the biceps tendon origin is seen. More anterior, you can see the biceps tendon. This is a superior labrum. You can see the biceps tendon and trace it down into the pulley and the bicipital groove going inferior. More anteriorly, you can see the subscapularis muscle, which is a multipennate muscle. And all of these are the tendons inserting onto the lesser tuberosity. Sagittal images, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor and subscapularis muscle. And 
you can see how subscapularis is a multipennate muscle. So you can see all these multiple small tendon-like appearance. This is supraspinatus. This is infraspinatus. This is spine. This here is the long head of biceps tendon, this ovoid structure. As we come further, laterally, you can see this is the subscapularis tendon. This is the supraspinatus still here. And this is the infraspinatus. Now, we cannot make out where supraspinatus ends and infraspinatus begins on the corner images. So, sagittal images help us to look at that. This structure here is the long head of biceps tendon. This is the coracoacromial ligament, this black line. And this is the acromioclavicular joint here. As you come further laterally, you can see all of this is the subscapularis. All of this is the supraspinatus and all of this is infraspinatus. This is TD spine. And as you come further near the insertion, you can see supraspinatus footprint, infraspinatus footprint. Also look at this section, how the muscles are seen. So the normal muscles should all be gray. There should not be any volume loss. There should not be any fatty infiltration. Now, let me talk of rotator cuff. What are the questions that we want to answer? The main question that we need to answer is, is there a tear or not? If so, what is the size of the tear? Is there muscle atrophy? Is there impingement? Or is it something which is a tear mimic clinically? How does the normal tendon look? You can see the normal supraspinatus tendon on these fat sat T2 images as well as these PD images. You can see that the tendon looks completely dark. So when the tendon looks completely dark, that is normal. This here is the footprint. All of this is the footprint. This is the critical zone. This is the myotendinous junction. And this is the muscle belly. So this is the normal appearance of To see if I can get a pointer. Okay. Yeah. So this here is the footprint. This here is the critical zone. And this here is the myotendinous junction. We need to look for all of these areas carefully. See how the footprint is wide on the greater tuberosity. Now, what do we see in tendinosis? When the tendon degenerates, Unlike normal tendon where the fibers are tightly packed and there's no place for the hydrogen protons to move around. But because the tendon has degenerated now, there is tendinosis, the fibers become more space between them and the hydrogen protons are able to move around. So they give out brighter signal. So compare this normal tendon to this where you have abnormal tendon you can see this tendon is enlarged. It is thickened in size at its critical zone. And you can see this full area of tendon shows hyperintensity. When I see this on it, this is a PD image, proton density image. When I see it on T2 weighted image, I can see that this area of tendinosis is bright, but it's not as bright as the fluid in the joint. This is fluid, this bright signal. It's not that bright. So that means this is tendinosis. And when I talk of tendinosis, I'll call it mild, moderate, or severe based on the appearance. This here would be advanced tendinosis. And I'll say whether it is insertional or critical zone. So the correct term is tendinosis or tendinopathy and not tendinitis because there's no inflammation. This is mucoid degeneration. Tendinitis we use when there is calcific tendinitis because then there is a component of inflammation. Now, in this patient, what do we see? On this proton density image, if I look at the tendon, this is the outline of the tendon. And within it, you have bright signal. On T2 weighted image, this bright signal is almost like that of fluid. Okay? But if you look at it, it's like as bright as fluid. So compare that with this tendinosis where it's not as bright as fluid. Here it is as bright as fluid, but if you look at it, 
these black bursal surface fibers are intact and so are these articular surface fibers so this is an interstitial tear so this will not be visible on arthrogram or an arthroscopy when we talk of a partial thickness tear interstitial tear we need to say how much of the thickness of the tendon is involved so here it's involving more than 50% of the tendon thickness and this is the longitudinal extent of it this dimension here is the longitudinal extent this is an interstitial tear or you may have a partial thickness tear like this where you can see this tear here is at the supraspinatus footprint it involves more than 50% of the tendon thickness only these few bursal surface fibers are intact so this is the intact tendon and this is the bright signal is the tear when i look at it on sagittal images all of this is the infraspinatus tendon which is enlarged and shows bright signal but not as bright as fluid so this is moderate tendinosus and all of this is the supraspinatus and here you can see this is the ap dimension of this tear so from here till here is the tear so i would say this there is a more than 50% thickness anterior supraspinatus footprint under surface tear articular surface tear because bursal surface fibers are still intact measuring this much ap without significant retraction there is mild to moderate subacromial bursal fluid so just seeing fluid does not always mean a tear you can have bursitis without tear also here you have this large subacromial bursal fluid as against that if i look at this case what do i see this is the tendon and i can see more than 75% thickness supraspinatus footprint bursal surface tear so the articular surface fibers few are intact but the bursal surface there's a tear it's communicating here towards the joint towards the bursa and if you look at the sagittal images this is the infraspinatus and all of this is the supraspinatus so now this tear is in the posterior footprint and this is the ap dimension so i'll say more than 75% and this tendon also shows tendinosus moderate tendinosus so moderate supraspinatus tendinosus with more than 75% thickness posterior footprint tear measuring this much ap with this much retraction not too much maybe about 3 4 mm retraction here if i look at this case what do i see i see articular surface fibers are intact the bursal surface fibers are not intact this is the distal tendon so if you see this here is a bursal surface tear but now this is at the critical zone again this supraspinatus what is remaining shows severe tendinosus changes so i will say this is the longitudinal extent of this tear i will say more than 50% thickness supraspinatus critical zone bursal surface tear measuring this much longitudinal and on sagittal images i will say how much a so we saw interstitial tear first we saw tendinosus then we saw interstitial tear next we saw footprint articular surface tear now we can see footprint bursal surface tear and how we need to look at the ap dimension on the sagittal image to also decide the number of uh, the anchors which will be put here is a critical zone more than 50% thickness supraspinatus critical zone bursal surface tear okay so different example here is another example where you can see there is an under surface tear this is the bursal surface fibers which are intact and then see how this tear is turning in and becoming interstitial so this tear is an under surface tear and then interstitial so that we call it as a delaminating tear because this is almost like a flap or a delamination so i will say there is a delaminating under surface more than 50% thickness under surface tear of the supraspinatus tendon measuring so much longitudinal and ap dimension 
Now, same tears when they are anterior, you may call it as rimbrand tear, you have pasta lesion, but more than those terms, I think it's better if we talk about how much thickness of the tendon is involved, that is in this dimension. How much is the longitudinal extent of the tear, that is this dimension. And on a SAG image, what is the AP dimension? So these three dimensions give a better idea of what the tear is. Coming to full thickness tears, these are easy to identify because you can see a clear fluid filled gap. So here you can see there is no tendon from here till here. No tendon from here up till here. So there is a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus tendon. And on a sagittal image, if I imagine this as the humerus and this as the AP extent of the supraspinatus, this infraspinatus, this spine. So if this entire AP dimension of the supraspinatus is torn, I'll call it as a complete full thickness tear. If say only anterior portion is involved, I'll say full thickness tear of the anterior fibers measuring this much dimension AP with retraction up to the lateral humeral head by this dimension. So how much is it retracted by? We may often see these kind of cystic, introscious cystic changes at the emphasis. When they are small, they're just degenerative. But if they are large, it's important that we give the size because otherwise the anchor may not hold there if there's a large cystic change right at the emphasis. You can see this joint fluid is tracking through the tear into the subacromial bursa. So this is a full thickness tear. Now, here is another full thickness tear where we can see there is no tendon from the insertion and the retracted tendon is almost up to this level. So there's this retraction up to the glenohumeral joint level by this much centimeter. So that is important. If the retraction is too much medial to the glenoid also. Surgical repair may not be possible or one may have to do an open surgery. Here you can see another patient where you can see a supraspinatus tendon there with retraction just medial to the glenoid up to this level. From the insertion, it has got retracted all this way up. And in this patient, you can see the infraspinatus tendon is also torn and retracted up to a similar extent. So from here up till here, the infraspinatus tendon is also torn. So those supraspinatus tendon tears are most common, but they can extend into the infraspinatus and infraspinatus tendon also may be torn. If we look at sagittal image of this patient, there is no supraspinatus, no infraspinatus. This here is the teres minor and this here is the subscapularis tendon, okay? And these tendons are torn, retracted up to this level. Now, in this patient, if we look at it, what do we see? The biceps groove is empty. There's no longer a biceps tendon. And where is it? It has come here and it is lying here. This is the long head of biceps tendon, okay? Now, on the sagittal images, if you look at it, there is no supraspinatus, there's no infraspinatus. There is complete full thickness tear of supraspinatus as well as infraspinatus. Whenever we see biceps dislocation, we need to look carefully at the subscapularis tendon. You can see the subscapularis tendon here. You can see this tendon here and can you see a more than 50% thickness undersurface tear here? So this is the length of the more than 50% thickness undersurface tear of the subscapularis. On the sagittal images, this is the subscapularis and you can see this tear out here. So this is the craniocaudal dimension of the subscapularis tear and there is extra articular dislocation of the biceps tendon. Now, when we see so, uh, rotator cuff tendon tear, we need to look at the biceps tendon and we also need to look at the muscles. 
so the muscle is it atrophic or not or is there volume loss we need to look at that how do we do that if i look at the sagittal images where i can see the coracoid process as i can see here this is the coracoid process and this is the spine of scapula so if i draw a line if this is the supraspinatus fossa so if i look at supraspinatus fossa the normal supraspinatus occupies most of this fossa if there is atrophy you can see how this muscle you can see it's small in size and you can see it with fatty infiltration another way to do it is from the coracoid process draw a line to the acromion to the scapula sorry spine of scapula normal supraspinatus should be crossing it up going above it but if there is atrophy you can see that it is not crossing it this muscle is significantly atrophic when we see rotator cuff muscle in uh, atrophy remember either there is a tendon tear if there is no tendon tear then that is due to denervation changes here you can see the supraspinatus tend muscle showing marked atrophy with fatty infiltration the supraspinatus tendon is torn with retraction up to the medial to the glenoid if you look at the subscapularis muscle here it shows mild atrophy with fatty infiltration these are the fatty infiltration so now two things one is volume loss where the muscle is smaller in size but there is no fatty infiltration other one is atrophy where the muscle is small in size and shows fatty infiltration volume loss muscle without fatty infiltration may still recover with rehab but once there is atrophy that muscle contracting ability would be lost one may still operate for pain relief but the prognosis because move the function wise may not be completely recovering because of the atrophy you can use the gutelier classific uh, classification where you have 1 2 3 0 where there is no fat one where you have less of fat and more of muscle fibers two some where you have equal fat and muscle fibers higher grade would be something like this where there is more of fat and less of muscle fibers even if you don't use this classification we use mild moderate severe atrophy with fat linking we very often see teres minor muscle atrophy you can see this here this is the teres minor muscle this is infraspinatus this is teres minor here here again you can see infraspinatus supraspinatus subscapularis and this is teres minor mm -hmm. and these patients are usually asymptomatic so it's something we see all the time but may not exactly be clinically significant what is rotator cuff arthropathy in this patient if you see the supraspinatus tendon is completely torn and retracted all the way medial to the glenoid infraspinatus is also torn there is no rotator cuff here you can see the subscap also shows a tear and is retracted almost up to medial humeral head and the humeral head has migrated superiorly it is hitting against the inferior surface of the acromion and you can see there is no cartilage here at all this complete cartilage loss you can see these osteophytes here so this becomes rotator cuff arthropathy because of superior migration of the humeral head which abuts against the acromion you may have loss of cartilage along it and rotator cuff arthropathy becomes end stage disease just to show you an example i hope you can appreciate the cartilage here this gray lining is the cartilage black is the cortex and this gray is the cartilage but look at that here there is no cartilage at all this is rotator cuff arthro and you can see how this humeral head is almost getting slightly flat now this is very important impingement is not mri diagnosis one cannot diagnose this impingement on mri because in mri the patient lies down with his arm by this side 
and it's a static examination. The arm is not in abduction in the position in which impingement will occur. So you cannot diagnose impingement on it. Impingement can be diagnosed only clinically, clinical examination or on ultrasound. Because on ultrasound, you can do a dynamic examination. And during dynamic examination, you can see how the supraspinatus tendon is moving under the acromial arch, whether there is free movement or there is impingement. So MR cannot diagnose impingement. But in somebody who's clinically suspected to have impingement or ultrasound shows impingement, MR can identify the various things, substrates, which could lead to impingement. So let's look at a few examples. So how does impingement happen? This is the coracoid process. This is the acromial. This is the coracoacromial ligament. So this is the arch. This space is already narrow. On abduction, it gets further narrow. Here in this patient, you can see this. This is the coracoid process. This is where the acromion is. This is the coracoacromial ligament, this black structure. And see how the supraspinatus tendon is passing under it. So during abduction, this gets impinged. So what are the various things we are looking for? We are looking for the undersurface of the acromion. We look at this on the Sagittal images. It could be flat like this, type 1. It could be little concave like this, type 2. You may have anterior inferior bone-like projection, which is type 3. And you may have a fourth type, which is convex downwards. This is concave, this is convex downwards. Now, everyone will have some kind or the other type of undersurface of acromion out of these four. But this type 3 is the one which is most associated with impingement and tendon tear. So normally we don't mention in our reports if we have these three. But when you have this one, we do mention it. This or this we do mention it. But doesn't mean that everyone with type 3 acromion under surface will have impingement. On coronal images, this is the clavicle and this is the acromion. Normally the acromion should be kind of relatively more horizontal. Here you can see it sloping down. This is a coronal image. You can see it sloping down. Lateral down sloping of the acromion can also lead to impingement. In this patient, you can see how there is significant tendinosis and subacromial bursal fluid. AC joint arthrosis. So this is the acromioclavicular joint. Let's just look at a normal one. Yeah. This is how a normal AC joint looks. While here, you can see all these hypertrophic changes. You can see this capsule hypertrophic. You can see effusion. You can see osteophytes. So this is AC joint. OA, we call it mild, moderate, severe. Sometimes there can be a lot of marrow edema, and that could be the cause of pain, local tenderness. This patient, if you look, also has mild to moderate tendinosis. There is mild subacromial bursal fluid too, but there's no tear. Okay. Acromial spur. So these are traction enthesophytes at the acromial attachment of the coracoacromial ligament. So you'll see this, you can see this small bony projection, a keel-like spur. And these have a very high association with impingement and rotator cuff tear. In this patient itself, you can make out, you can see here, this is the spur and this is the supraspinatus tendon, which shows mild to moderate tendinosis. And you can see there's a bursal surface tear exactly at this location due to the impingement. So look at the non-fat sat sequence for these acromial spurs. Os acromial is due to non-fusion of apophysis of the anterior acromion. This, you can see this line here, that is os acromion. Most of the times it's asymptomatic. Sometimes you may have marrow edema around it, which is stress edema. And sometimes it can cause impingement. Remember not to diagnose os acromion before the age of 25 years, because this normal apophysis fuses between 22 to 25 years. Only if this persists after that, we label it as an os acromion, and majority of the time they are asymptomatic. Few other conditions of the rotator cuff 
which can present with excruciating pain. No trauma, nothing. Patient suddenly presents with acute pain. And you see a lot of edema. You can see all this significant edema around the infraspinatus. And you're wondering, what is this? It looks very scary. Is it infection? When you look carefully, you will see this dark area within the area of edema. So this is a calcific infraspinatus tendonitis. We are all used to seeing calcification as bright on the X-ray, on the ultrasound, on the X, uh, CT. On MR, calcification is seen as dark area. So we need to look carefully within this edema for these areas. Yes, ultrasound would be more sensitive to pick up very tiny calcification. But MR also, when most of the times when there's acute exacerbation, you can always see this calcification well. Another patient, and now you can see calcification along the subscapularis. Again, there's a lot of marrow edema and bursal fluid because of that. When you have calcific tendinosis, it can cause hyperemia. There can be underlying bone softening and into which a cyst, a cyst is formed and the calcification goes into that. Here in this patient, at the subscapularis emphasis, you can see this very dark area. It is not a cyst. It's not a degenerative cystic change because cyst should be bright on the T2 sequence. Here it is dark on all the sequence. So this is subscapularis calcific tendinosis with the calcification entering into the underlying bone. Now calcification, though it's most common around supraspinatus, can occur at subscapularis, infraspinatus, glenoid labrum, superior labrum attachment, capsule attachment, biceps tendon attachment, pectoralis major in, uh, attachment, as well as coracoclavicular ligament attachment. So any ligament tendon attachment, you can see this calcification presenting as severe pain, calcific periarthritis. Uh, we have published an article in clinical radiology where we ha have discussed all these atypical locations of uh, calcification around the shoulder. The mimics of rotator cuff tear, where the patient presents with uh, clinically what is suspected as rotator cuff tear, there's been trauma, radiograph has not shown anything, could be an undisplaced greater tuberosity fracture. Because if it's not displaced much, it can be missed on the radiograph. There's a greater tuberosity fracture and you can see the marrow edema. It is an acute fracture. Another condition which is not a clinical, uh, which is not it's a clinical diagnosis. MR is usually not done to diagnose that. MR is done to look for other findings. Is the rotator cuff intact? In this patient, the supraspinatus tendinosis is there, but the tendon itself is intact. And you can see this inferior capsule is all thickened and bright. This is the rotator interval area, which normally should be bright like this, but instead it's all homogeneous. This is adhesive capsule. Sometimes the patient may come with suspected rotator cuff tear. The rotator cuff is intact, but what do we see? This here, if you see this teres minor, this teres major, this is how normal muscle should. When I look carefully, the entire infraspinatus muscle is swollen, uh, is uh, showing diffuse bright signal. This is the anterior glenoid muscle, again showing diffuse signal. This is the posterior glenoid. So when you see multiple muscle denervation edema, one, is their nerve getting compressed, for example, by a paralabral cyst? Or if that's not, could this be due to brachial plexitis, brachial plexus neuritis, which leads to parsonage turner syndrome? Chronic denervation will lead to muscle atrophy, but subacute denervation will be seen only as diffuse edema. So the kind of checklist that we can look at when we want to look for rhetoric of pathologies, one, is there tear? If so, is it full thickness, partial thickness? Partial thickness, is it 50%, less than 50% thickness, 50% thickness, more than 50% thickness, more than 75% thickness, near full thickness? What is the AP extent of the tear as seen on sagittal images? How much is the retraction of the torn tendon of the longitudinal dimension? And the location of the tear. Is it at the insertion? Is it at the critical zone? Or rarely is it at the myotendon? We always look at supraspinatus, but we also need to look at infraspinatus, subscapularis, 
and biceps. Yes, sir. We need to look at the muscle. Is there muscle volume loss? Is there atrophy? Grade it. We cannot diagnose impingement on MRI, but yes, we can look for the substrate for impingement like acromial spur, type three undersurface of acromion, acromioclavicular osteoarthrosis. We can look for lateral downsloping acromion. So all of these which potentially can cause impingement. But impingement can be diagnosed only on clinical examination and on dynamic ultrasound. And lastly, look at the cartilage. Because if there is osteoarthrosis, cuff arthropathy, then it's kind of an end-stage disease. Okay, so that's about the cuff. We will uh, take up some questions and after that we will go... Uh, to few cases and look at how we look at cases. Which plane can we appreciate subacromial bursitis as it's usually associated with any supraspinatus tear? So yes, we usually look at the coronal images. So I can just show you an example. Yeah, this is the coronal image. And you can see here, this is the subacromial bursa. So the coronal images shows us the subacromial bursa very well. So yes, tears are associated often with bursal fluid, but you may have bursal fluid without a tear also. It can be just bursitis. What is significance of the term critical zone and what does it imply? So critical zone is this area, about a centimeter proximal to its footprint. This is kind of a watershed zone, just like in Achilles, you have the watershed zone. This is more hypovascular compared to rest of the tent. So that's why you have tears often here. So earlier, the near uh, theory of impingement that the tears are due to impingement was more well uh, known. But then if the tears were more due to impingement, more tears should have been bursal surface. But in practice, we noticed more tears are articular surface. So then Cordman came up with this th uh, theory where you have the hypovascular zone at the critical zone leading to degeneration and early where exactly to look for subscribe on axial cuts? Is it just below the coracoid and how much down? Yeah, so when we plan the scan, if we look at it, it would be slightly below the midline. Okay, if I can just go back to this image so that I can make it clear. Yeah, so this is from superior, we are coming inferior. So somewhere here is where we would plan the sections. So just below the equator is where we would plan the sections. How to differentiate infra from teres minor on coronal sections? Yes. So infra from teres minor on coronal images is not difficult here. You can see this. This is the muscle here. If I can show you. You can see this. This is the infra teres minor. And this is the infra spinatus. But remember, the best demarcation is made on the sagittal image. So for example, here, this is the supraspinatus, this is the infraspinatus, this is the teres minor, and all of this is the subscapularis. And then you can trace it further. Tendinosis with tear, how to exactly differentiate the tear? Yeah. So that's the reason I specifically showed these. Let me just go through that again. This is tendinosis, where you have bright signal in the tendon, but on T2-weighted images, it is not as bright as the fluid here. You can see this fluid in the joint cavity. It's not that bright. As against that, look at this. This bright signal within the tendon, or for example, look at this bright signal within the tendon, is as bright as this bursal fluid. That suggests a tear. So always look at T2-weighted image. Is it similar to fluid signal intensity? And when you have, like, this is tendinosis with tear. You can see this portion, it's not fluid intensity. So this is tendinosis. This portion is fluid signal. Same way, if I look at this, this portion is almost fluid signal intensity. So it is an interstitial tear on T2 image. But this is not fluid signal intensity. So this is tendinosis. 
which is best sequence to view the cuff tear it is fat sap t2 and proton density plate not pdfs because t2 fat sap is better to look for tears because you want to look for the fluid signal intensity okay so i think if uh, all the questions are uh, please feel free to ask more questions but meanwhile maybe we can just look at about two cases to see how uh, we describe these i'll just share my screen yeah i'll just share the screen again give me just a minute Yeah, I'll just share my screen. We'll look at few cases. Yeah, uh, is my uh, screen visible to everybody? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So I'll just zoom this up. Yeah. So this is a patient who's presented with uh, shoulder pain, and we are looking for rotator cuff. So I'm coming from posterior to anterior. So this is the most posterior section. So this is the infraspinatus. And I can see this infraspinatus tendon is not dark. Normal tendon should be dark on a sequence. So this is severe tendinosis. As I come further, I can see here severe tendinosis of the supraspinatus also. But still, it's not as bright as fluid within it. But sometimes when you have very severe tendinosis with inside, you can see all these fibers are almost disorganized. So then the patient may be symptomatic like a rotator cuff tear and may even be treated as one. But it is very advanced tendinosis. As I come more anteriorly, this is the anterior supraspinatus, which shows about moderate tendinosis. Now, I'll confirm this on the sagittal images because that will show it to me well. These are the sagittal images. And can you see this? The, this is the T minor, which is normal. The infraspinatus and the supraspinatus show advanced tendinosis. And here you can almost see some fibers getting disorganized. So this is almost like the beginnings of a tear at this location. We need to look at the subscapularis. And in this patient, you can see this is the subscapularis here. Now, I'll look at it on the sagittal image to know whether this is a tear or not. Something is not looking right. So I can take the reference image and yes, we are right. If we look at it, can you see here? Oh, one second, let me get an arrow. Yeah. Can you see this bit here? This distance here, the subscapularis tendon here is showing a tear. Okay, I would call this more than 50% thickness or a high grade tear of the distal subscapularis. And I confirm this on the sagittal image. How do I see? This is the subscapularis. So I keep tracing it more laterally and towards the insertion. Can you see this? If you can see here this bright signal, that here is the subscapularis undersurface tear. So this patient has a high grade subscapularis undersurface tear and has got advanced infraspinatus and supraspinatus tendinosis. And supraspinatus, this is like this is the area where it's almost a tear is happening. You can see how these fibers are disorganized, but right now I don't have a full thickness tear. This is here the biceps tendon.
this is the section where I look for the muscles. So if I look at these muscles, supraspinatus is normal, infraspinatus is normal, teres minor is normal. But when I look at the subscapularis, you can see that the subscapularis here is showing mild atrophy with fatty infiltration. Okay, so that again, whenever you see muscle atrophy, look carefully, very likely there's going to be a tear. We look at the AC joint. This is the acromioclavicular joint. There is mild osteoarthrosis, but nothing very bad. This is the long head of biceps tendon, which is normal. So when we have supraspinatus tear, the long head of biceps tendon starts acting to keep the humeral head down, and that can show tendinosis and tears. Uh, let's look at the next case. Let's look at this case. Now, when I'm seeing this case, we are coming from posterior to anterior. I can see that the infraspinatus does not look good. You can see the tendon tear. The infraspinatus is torn from its insertion and retracted up to the glenohumeral joint level. And then I can see the supraspinatus tendon also torn and retracted up to the medial humeral head. This is the biceps tendon, and these are few anterior fibers of supraspinatus which are intact, but rest of the supraspinatus is torn. We'll confirm that and see it on the sagittal images. Yeah. So we trace from here. This here is the supraspinatus. This here is the long head of biceps tendon. This is subscapularis and this is infraspinatus. So as I come more laterally, you can see the supra and infraspinatus tendon stop here. There is no supra and infraspinatus tendon except for these few anterior supraspinatus tendon fibers which show severe tendinosis. This is the subscapularis tendon here. So now if I look at it on axial images, I can see this subscapularis shows moderate to greater tendinosis with some low grade undersurface fraying, but not no large tear or anything. Okay, so there's a small interstitial tear here in the subscapularis at this location, but no large retracted tear otherwise. This is the middle glenohumeral ligament. This is the long head of biceps tendon. And when I look at long head of biceps tendon, it's not completely dark, so it shows mild tendinosis. So this patient has a Full thickness tear of the infraspinatus and the supraspinatus tendon with retraction up to the medial humeral head. Few intact anterior most sub supraspinatus tendon fibers which show severe tendinosis. Moderate to greater subscapularis tendinosis with a small interstitial tear near its insertion. Mild biceps tendinosis and can you see here this osseous projection. So this is the type 3 undersurface of acromion. We'll mention that because that could be causing impingement. And we also look at this. You can see this bony spur out here. So there's an acromial spur. AC joint OA is mild. Muscle atrophy, let's look at the muscle atrophy now. The muscles don't look right. Can you see here? This is normal teres minor. Infraspinatus shows moderate atrophy. Let's look at the sagittal images for better. And yes, this is clear here. You can see here how the subscap is normal, infraspinatus is normal. You can see that supraspinatus muscle shows mild to moderate atrophy and the infraspinatus muscle shows moderate to greater atrophy with fatty infiltration. This is normal muscle and this is muscle atrophy with fatty infiltration. Okay, So this is all that we need to look for a tendon pathology. Let's look at the next one. So 
So always in shoulder, we start looking at the coronal images first and then correlate for other structures. So the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, we'll see on coronal and sagittal. Subscapularis, we'll see on sagittal and atrium. So here, when I look at this, there is a acromial moderate bursal, bursal fluid. This is the infraspinatus tendon, which shows tendinosis, but not as bright as fluid, so it's not a tear. I come more anteriorly, I start seeing supraspinatus tendinosis, but along that tendinosis, can you see this bursal surface tear out here? So this is the tendon here, this is the tendon here, and its footprint, it has got a less than 50% thickness bursal surface tear. I'll confirm that on the sagittal image because I'll need to give the measurement. Can you see here this one? So this is the AP dimension of this tear, this here. This is AP dimension. This is less than 50% thickness, anterior supraspinatus footprint, bursal surface tear measuring so much AP and so much longitudinal, small interosseous cystic changes at its emphasis. The long head of biceps tendon is fine. It looks normal. Let's look at the subscapularis tendon. Subscapularis tendon only shows moderate tendinosis. Otherwise, it is intact. I want to look for the muscle atrophy. If any, there is no muscle atrophy. All the muscles look good. Is there any... AC joint osteoarthrosis or subacromial spur. Let's look at that. AC joint, there's just mild arthrosis. There is no spur. There is no bony spur at this location. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there's a question on labral tear implication. So especially in older patients, very frankly, uh, the labral tears, so we just mentioned it in the body and don't even talk about it in the impression because it's so often that we see degenerative superior labral tears and in older patients, not much is done about it. But in younger patients, yes, especially if you have a posterior superior labral tear and you have tendinosis or tear involving posterior supraspinatus, anti-infraspinatus, then we need to think of internal impingement or posterior superior impingement is something we'll think of in that case. But in older patients, labral tears degenerative are very common. This is another case. We are looking at it from posterior to anterior. You can see that there is no infraspinatus tendon here. So there's an infraspinatus tendon tear. As we come more anteriorly, there's a full thickness supraspinatus tendon tear like we can see here. You can see there's, the tendon is retracted roughly up to the glenohumeral joint level up to here. Now let's look at the axial and sagittal images in this patient. Is there muscle atrophy? Yes, there is muscle atrophy. So you can see this muscle, it's not, the infraspinatus muscle is more atrophic compared to supraspinatus. Also, if we look at it, look at the subscapularis tendon. It shows severe tendinosis. And at this location, there is a tear of the subscapularis. Normally, the subscapularis should be thicker. Here you can see all of this is tear. This is subscapularis. Superior fibers show a high-grade tear. And then when you look at it, look at the biceps tendon. It's easy to trace biceps tendon from below upwards. This is biceps tendon, biceps tendon. Instead of going in the bicipital groove, can you see it is dislocated medially? It shows severe tendinosis. That's why it's looking like this. Again, sagittal images help us. This is the biceps tendon here showing severe tendinosis and is dislocated medially due to the subscapularis tendon tear. Subscapularis muscle does not show at all. Okay. Let's look at the AC joint. AC joint is normal. There is no osteoarthrosis. There is no spur. And the cartilage is good. So look at the cartilage here. Look at this gray line. That's the cartilage. So the cartilage is good. There's no rotator cuff arthrosis.
So in this patient, as I'm coming from posterior to anterior, this is the infraspinatus, which is intact. More anterior, I can see supraspinatus tendinosis. You can see this supraspinatus tendinosis. More anterior, I can see a lot of deltoid muscle edema. I can see bursal fluid. I can see a lot of soft tissue edema. So when somebody has a lot of soft tissue edema and there's no trauma, immediately I start thinking of, could this be calcific tendinitis? If so, where is it? I look for it very carefully. And can you see this little dark area? If I try to look at on this, it is here. Difficult to make out on axial images. Can you see this dark foci? So this is calcification at the subscapularis insertion. So you have calcific subscapularis tendinosis because of which there is so much of bursitis and muscle as well as soft tissue edema. So when you have a lot of edema, patient has had not, had not had any trauma, look very carefully for these calcific foci. And then if you're in doubt, you can always do an ultrasound. You can look for an X-ray to look for that focus of calcification. But on MR, uh, confidently, we're able to say what it is. Let's look at the last case. So when we have a post-op post -op case, post rotator cuff repair, then we don't try to look for whether tendon is dark or not. Because after surgery, the tendon will not look dark. We only try to see, is there continuous tissue, tendon tissue going up to the anchors? That's what we are trying to see. It may show some bright signal. That is still fine. It is expected post-operative findings. So in this patient, you can see that infraspinatus tendon shows severe tendinosis. Posteriorly, then it is torn. So these are the anchors. You can see here, the anchors can be seen well. There are these four anchors out here, this location. But you do not see any tendon tissue continuous going up to it. So can you see this tendon is strong? So this is somebody who's had a re -tab. So when you're looking for re -tab, one, look for continuous tendon tissue going up to there. Don't look at its signal intensity. Even if it is a, a thickened, bright-looking tissue, but going continuous, then it is fine. Here, there is a tear. We look at these Anchors here, sometimes there can be migration, they can be dislodged, you can have osteolysis around them. Sometimes you may have post-op infection. And also we should remember that when we are looking at post-op cases, on the sagittal images, even normally you may have some gap because the entire AP thickness may not be repaired. So there could still be some AP gap, but if majority of the tendon, you can see continuous tendon tissue, it is fine. In this patient here, there is a re-tear of the tendon Another factor which helps us look at is the atrophy. So when there is muscle atrophy, especially if it is increased compared to the earlier scan, then we can diagnose a retail. Okay, let's look at questions. Uh, landmark to see infraspinatus tear on coronal. Yeah, so there's no landmark really. While coming from posterior, it is infraspinatus. Where infraspinatus ends and supraspinatus begins, you cannot uh, make out on coronal. You have to correlate with the sagittal. Uh, does gout or pseudogout crystal uh, similar to that? Uh, so gout or pseudogout can also have hypointense, but there will not be this hypointense and signal, uh, signal void area. It will be still more... Uh, less dark as compared to calcification. Uh, which level of sagittal section do we see for got layer staging? So not only sagittal, we look at sagittal, we look at coronal images also. Sagittal, when we are seeing, we look at that section where I showed you, the coropoid process and the spine of scapula between that. But we look on all images, not only sagittal images. Uh, if no tear, does fatty infiltration indicate denervation? Yes, it does. So if there's no tear at all, completely intact tendon, but muscles are showing uh, atrophy, then it would suggest denervation, yes. Uh, land uh, does, okay. So I think we answered all the questions. Any other questions? Supraspinatus occupancy ratio, exactly what I showed you. So uh, maybe I can just share this again. I'll just quickly share that one slide so that we 
know what we are talking about. Yeah, I'm just sharing the screen. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. So this is the suprascapular uh, occupancy ratio. So this is the coracoid process. This is the spinal scapula. And between that, the supraspinatus should occupy all entire uh, the fossa. When there is atrophy, it will not be occupied. Similarly, the same section, you draw a line from coracoid process to acromion. Supraspinatus normally should be crossing above it. If there's atrophy, it's obviously not crossing above it. This is very gross atrophy, but for milder ones, those uh, things help. Yeah, so I think that uh, I showed how to measure. So you just look at it, how much of the fossa is being occupied. Magic angle artifact is when the tendon is at 55 degrees, any structure is at 55 degrees to the external magnetic field in the magnet machine that we make the patient lie down. You can artifactually get bright signal in the tendon. This can be seen near critical zone of suprasmatic. How do I make it? It's not real, it's artifact because it's seen only on the T1 or proton density image. On T2, it's completely dark. There's no hyperintensive signal. So that's just a magic angle artifact. Okay, so I think we've answered all the questions. There'll be uh, the next uh, session, which is going to be there. The other... Uh, uh, things which have not been covered in these earlier sessions would be covered. So again, feel free to uh, put in the group uh, other things which you need covered in shoulder. So that can be covered then. And also we'll be sending you some cases that you can have a look at and we can discuss those on that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Thank you, ma'am. It is good lecture. It was good lecture. My pleasure. Thank you so much.